Hi, welcome to Ecole Chocolat's Chocolate Masters Hangouts. We're so excited to be getting together and talking about chocolate. What could be better? Hi, I'm Sarah Hartman, moderator for Chocolate Masters Hangout. Today we bring together the key volunteers of the Heirloom Cacao Preservation Initiative known as the HCP. Um, I would like to welcome Dan Pearson from Marayon Chocolate, who is in the HCP Executive Committee. So we are having some difficulties with Dan's connection, and um, hopefully he can stay on throughout the program. Um, if there are any issues, we'll try to get him back on. Um, we have Penn Williams from Ecole Chocolat, who is um, in the HCP Executive Committee. Jim Eber, who is the HCP Director of Communication and Administration, and Lindo Meinhardt, who is from the USDA Agricultural Research Science, who is the Science Advisor to the HCP. Lindo has the cocoa tree behind him. <laughs> That's right. Oh, yes. <laughs> very representative. Um, we have a very important topic for discussion today, Save Our Chocolate. Um, chocolate is a food made from the fruit of the Theobroma cacao tree, which grows in small family farms um, 20 degrees north or south of the equator all around the world. Um, the vast majority of these, about 95%, is inexpensive, flavor lacking, bulk grade cacao. The remaining 5% is considered fine flavor cacao and is being displaced by bulk grade cacao and other crops at a very alarming rate. Uh, being from Brazil, I've seen this firsthand and what we're losing every year. And time is of critical importance to save fine flavor cacao, uh, which becomes the most flavorful, most complex chocolate. Um, and they're vanishing unless we act to identify, preserve, and utilize them. And this is the mission of the Heirloom Cacao Preservation Initiative. So Jim, as the HCP Director of Communication, can you tell us what the HCP is and how you got involved? Sure. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so simply, you know, the cacao you described, the fine flavor cacao, they're the diamonds of cacao. And the HCP is a totally new way to evaluate, identify, and value that cacao that has that special, unique, extraordinary flavor. And we kind of want to map that flavor and unlock the secrets in order to save the chocolate by linking, for the first time, flavor to genetics. Genetics and chocolate has come a long way in the last, since the, the map of the gene uh, first was made public about five years ago. Um, and with the USDA um, and a panel of chocolate experts who evaluate the flavor and then working with the USDA to sort of we're going to try and plot the links between the flavor and the genetics. So we want to identify, we want to link the flavor to sort of get the reproduction going, and most importantly, we want to preserve, protect, and propagate the chocolate for future generations and reward the growers, the farmers, the small family farms that are growing it. That's it in a nutshell. I got involved because of Pam. Uh, I was lucky enough to uh, work with Pam on the book Raising the Bar, the Future of Fine Flavor Chocolate and we began our work right as the HCP was forming so I got to see it both come to fruition and move in the direction of hopefully identifying our first heirlooms in the year to come. Okay. And Dan, uh, um, you started Maranho Chocolate about six years ago and growing that business from the ground up um, took a lot of work and in the past three years, you've been involved with HCP. Um, it really is because of what I had experienced by discovering this white bean cacao and then sending it to Lendl. It tasted wonderful and finding out that it was very rare by doing the genetics. It then became a matter of seeing how it impacted people in the farm and how, how they, proud they were, the fact that they were getting quality. And it was a give back thing plus a profit thing for us. And so I think what happened to me, the reason I got so involved is I could see the impact. My business partner lives in Peru, he lives with the farmers, and we see what happens to them. And when you can see the pride and you can see the increased income, uh, then it made it all worthwhile. And that's why I've tried to devote my time to make it happen. 
Um, Lindo, then, um, as Jim was saying, um, the HCP is all about linking uh, great tasting cacao with their tree's unique DNA. So you can identify that genetic makeup and propagate those trees into the future. Um, is this the first time that scientists have tried to identify fine flavor cacao in this way? Um, thanks, Sarah. Um, uh, it's a great question. Um, I actually believe it is. It's one of this is the first time where flavor is really driving the entire process. In our lab, uh, we've looked at the genetic diversity of the cacao from all over the world, but we don't have an idea of what it tastes like. In many cases, we know many of the other traits about it, like disease resistance and yield and bean size, but flavor is the missing variable. Um, this is one of the first projects that we have that's been associated with that, which really takes the research to that level where we're actually really trying to combine the flavor with the genetics. So not only does the science of the project um, um, but it's also you're also working with a mechanical nose, right? That is um, sniffing out the aromatic notes of um, these samples. Can you tell us how does that work? Actually, basically it's a gas chromatograph and it's we use it to sample the, like you said, the aromatic or volatile compounds that are coming off of your chocolate and we're basically looking at the chocolate liqueur and we're separating those, uh, it separates those by size and by amount and our goal is to identify those compounds and then eventually try to link what those compounds are with the genetics and the genetic diver diversity of the cacao. Plus, we also uh, have the um, we have the mouths from our tasting panel that we can compare those two as well. Of, of course, and I think that's really the unique part about the HCP is that you're bringing not only a single uh, expert, but you're bringing multiple world experts together that are actually truly driving it and saying this is truly a unique flavor. Multidisciplinary effort. Yes. Um, Pam, your role as founder and lead instructor of the Call Chocolat keeps you very busy. Um, what compelled you to get so involved uh, with the HCP? Well, I, th I think it started about five years ago when I, we have, the, right now we have this renaissance happening in uh, chocolate, in fine, fine flavored chocolate, where we have chocolate makers, uh, artisans coming on stream that were not around. Uh, 10 years ago. We also have chocolatiers who are not just located in uh, Old World Europe but now proliferate through North America and South America, Mexico, Asia, Australia. So here are all these great um, chocolatiers and chocolate makers and manufacturers basically looking for wonderful tasting chocolate. And in order to get to wonderful tasting chocolate, you have to have wonderful tasting cacao. So it occurred to me that, that you know, where is this all going to come from? You know, where are we going to find all this cacao of great flavor when it's only 5% of the cacao grown anyway, and now we have more people chasing it. So that kind of um, had me start thinking about it. And then in a discussion with Linda, we were talking about how a lot of the older traditional uh, farmers and orchards that have that diverse flavor um, were getting torn out and basically replaced with high yield, high disease resistance hybrids. So all of a sudden, if we're not careful, I realized that not only were we kind of losing, the, the flavor was scarce to begin with, but we were kind of losing it. Then you add to that, the third thing that really got me worried was the fact that farmers, in a lot of cases, don't get paid any extra for having a fine flavor cacao. It's never really been recognized from a monetary perspective. So unless they deal directly with a chocolate manufacturer or chocolate maker, they're going to get the same price no matter what they grow. So a lot of times these older uh, traditional cacaos are a little harder to grow, um, don't aren't as prolific, 
Uh, the trees are maybe older and, and they haven't uh, replanted uh, the babies from those. And so all of a sudden, we're now going to get these hybrids proliferating and all our chocolate's going to taste exactly the same. If we think about what happened when this happened to tomatoes, it's to me a really great example. You know, in our grandparents' time, tomatoes came from the farm, they all tasted different, they all looked a little wonky, they were all delicious. Then agriculture figured out how to make great um, proliferation of tomatoes like you know they started growing them in big fields for transport all over and all of a sudden we had tomatoes that didn't taste like anything and now we're back to buying heirloom tomatoes from our local farmer farmers markets or specialty stores I don't want that to happen to cacao, so that's why I got really involved in this. I want to make sure that we keep that biodiversity for the generations to come. And Pam, this is a very um, large project that um, all of you have been together since the beginning. Do you have other graduates um, from your program that are also involved in the HCP? Yes, I'm, I'm really happy to say we have about nine graduates. Uh, very much involved in the um, HCP in our founding circle. Uh, people like Dandelion, Sweet Paradise Chocolatier, uh, Glacier Chocolatier, um, I'm forgetting four more other ones, but the, just some great people who really understood the need and, and got involved. We also have two of our graduates who have stepped up and are providing bursaries for small farmers who uh, need that support in order to get involved with the HS HCP and bring their, their beans into the program. And that's uh, um, Maya uh, Chocolate and also the Chocolatiers out of the Northwest. So it's um, I'm really happy to see that, that we've had so many people get involved from, from our, our family. Okay. Um, Dan, you're back. I'm going to take advantage of the fact that you're around um, and ask you um, a couple of questions. Um, um, I think all of us would love to be um, a part of the tasting panel, and that is something that the executive committee um, came up with and made decisions on who would participate. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Well, no. I think when it comes to, to flavor, uh, we, we really tried to get an international panel that had at least 20 years of experience, and, and had those, you know, had those nuances that only come from experience in selecting people like that. Uh, my end of the chocolate business really does. I, mean, I work with those kind of people because they have palates. My my end is in the jungle getting the beans, trying to get the best beans to people to make chocolate, to be able to make those kind of connections. Okay, so Jim, um, you mentioned the book that you co-authored with Pam. Uh, raising the bar: the future future of fine chocolate. Um, there's a section in it that I particularly like called "Cheap chocolate should not be an oxymoron." Um, is there a lesson there to be learned about saving chocolate? Right. Um, there's a huge lesson. I mean, it's the the line I you cut out there for a second. It's cheap chocolate should be an oxymoron, and it's it's and it's it's not. Um, and uh, it goes back actually partially to what Pam said earlier about the replacement um, let's think broadly let's get, let's think broadly about chocolate as a whole because we didn't we titled this save the chocolate but and we're talking about the diamonds but this applies to all chocolate I mean anybody I was a newbie to this whole world I you know, I love chocolate and you know and I love candy but the fact is that I never knew what went into making even the the most inexpensive chocolate I you know it's Unbelievably complex, and honestly, if given the number of things and steps that happen, I would fail that test pretty much any point in my academic career. If you said list from beginning to end, there's like 30 steps, and that's you know 10 before you leave the jungle, and um, it's incredibly complex. It starts with the farmer, and then by the time it's in your mouth, nothing comes close. Not coffee, you know, none of the other things that come out of the jungle come close, or that we eat come close to the amount of work that goes into making a chocolate bar and of any kind and it really it doesn't benefit us because 
let's you know forget about the diamonds for a moment it's not just the cheap hybrid the you know the low flavor hybrids that are replacing cacao it's other crops and cattle um, you know pineapples or soy or something that they can grow and that maybe a large company is helping them grow and so they're ripping out not just the 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 you know these diamonds but they're they're ripping out cacao as a whole and i think it goes back to the fact that we don't you know, chocolate's a childhood treat. We don't have the same stuff like we do in wine. Um, or, you know, for example, where people can really differentiate paying for quality um, and then love a value when something's really great. And there's all kinds of nuance in wine. And we're just beginning that. There's a renaissance, as Pam said, but it, there, it's just beginning. And we're just beginning to understand what goes into making a great chocolate and stop thinking about it as a cheap childhood treat and a commodity because it's traded as a commodity uh, you know cocoa um, and be willing to pay for this and it's really got to start at the top because the fact is that even in great restaurants chefs will pay you know twenty dollars a pound for the tiniest little herb that was picked right at the dew you know and so they can put that little baby thing on your plate and and you know and talk about it being something magnificent We'll say, yeah, but I won't pay more than three dollars a pound for my chocolate. Um, you know, most fine flavor people can't pay, can't find beans for three dollars a pound, and so we need to give up the ghost and be willing to pay more for our chocolate. Unless we can ensure um, that farmers can make a good living um, in growing fine flavor cacao, we can't. Um, I mean, we won't have any left. Um, so that's a part of the cost as well. And I guess some people believe that fair trade certification. Um, could be the answer. Um, what do you think about that? There is no the answer. Um, that that is for sure. I mean, fair trade didn't start in cocoa, and that's part of its difficulty. There's all kinds of politics, but fair trade really is is as much about marketing as it is about rewarding farmers. And in fact, many of the people who you know, you'll see this on. I'm I'm loath to say this because you know a lot of people will tell you that 90% of what you read on any wrapper of anything is propaganda, um, but the fact is is that I tried to find as being a good journalist going and finding out if you know were people in the fine flavor world really paying what they were paying and the answer was yes most of them are exceeding the fair trade line by leaps and bounds. Um, to try and reward farmers and instead of paying ten thousand dollars a year to certify fair trade they're giving that ten thousand dollars to the farmer that they're working with um, there are new fair trade things popping up it is it can be an answer and certifications are very important because marketing is very important um, but no there's got to be more answers uh, whether it's direct trade or whether it's um, Solutions like the HCP, which you know should go a long way to helping educate people just what goes into making this uh, fine flavored chocolate. Okay, um, Lindo, um, to go along with this conversation, after my experiences in Brazil, seeing what's happening there, and just recently we saw an article about the Nigerian government distributing eight different types um, varieties of cacao uh, that are yield high yield and disease resistant um, to 14 different cocoa producing states in, in the country um, to replace traditional crops, traditional cacao crops, um, not to mention um, the taste of these beans. Should we and chocolate lovers be worried about that? Um, as you mentioned earlier, and I think Pam alluded to it too, is that 95% of the world's supply is bulk chocolate. And there is there is still a need for that. and so. West Africa is known for bulk uh, chocolate production and basically the yields have stagnated there. So in the releases of these varieties is probably a good thing for that region because that will really help the local farmers. I think that's the problem is is where if those varieties become a, a problem is if, if it's mixed with cacao varieties that are sold as fine flavor and that's happening in other parts of the world is that the fine flavor is it's still there, but it's being it's being diluted because of the same price that you get. You don't get a differential price for the the better material, so they're mixing in the bulk chocolate with it, and that's where it really becomes a problem. So in in the those varieties, I think are probably very good bulk chocolate varieties. 
but um, since our, our main focus here is in fine chocolate, I think that that can be separated out. Um, and Jim, um, going back to you talking about um, the tasting panel, you helped them um, come up with a detailed rating system for um, the tasting of these beans and the samples. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the process that the HCP goes through um, to define these flavors? Uh, sure. Um, and hopefully you'll know more uh, when when the heirlooms come out, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a moment. The But the just to finish Dan's answer, the, the tasting panel is extraordinary. I mean, the, the seven, there's eight sort of members, seven really get involved. We may add more, but the minimum experience is, I mean, most of these people have spent a lifetime in chocolate, but 15 years experience minimum on the panel. I think we added it up, and it's comes out to more than two centuries of experience um, tasting and evaluating chocolate, um, not just manufacturing it. These are people who have been involved deeply, and with someone like Linda um, advising them from the science side, um, it's really quite incredible. And what they did was they created a system. They, these people get paid individually to do it all the time, and they're donating their time to us. And, if, and what, what they did was they created a way to evaluate. They know they're getting submitted great chocolate. So they want to find the best of the best. And what they did was they created a system that allowed all of them to use the current way they evaluate chocolate, because you got seven very different ways of tasting, and try and create a global score that looked at unique flavor as well as overall balance of flavor um, and talked it out, you know, and just began to communicate with each other. And I have to tell you, you know, you think – People are pretty set in their ways after two decades and two centuries of experience together. But all of these people are having a lot of fun talking to each other about this. But one of the most remarkable things and what really makes the HCP different than other, let's say, let's broadly use the rubric of awards or designations, is the fact that you can go to the HCP site, which is on finechocolateindustryassociation.org, um, and you can click right on it there, that um, you can see the whole process, all our protocols, right in front of you. The HCP from the tasting panel on down is trying to be as transparent as possible. Um, the evaluation process is blind. They have no idea where the beans are from. They only know the type of bean. Um, when it comes in, they evaluate completely blind. Um, but the process they go through is written right out on the site, and hopefully, when we designate our first heirlooms, um, you'll be able to see exactly what the tasting panel, not the individual. We're not going to say this guy voted this way and this person voted this way, but you'll be able to see what they thought about and begin to understand uh, the process in a broader sense, again, contributing to our education about what makes great chocolate. Mm -hmm. And Pam, uh, when will we know which cacaos have been designated as heirloom? Have there been any out yet? Well, there are things in process. That's what we can say right now. We have uh, about six samples in process going through the rigorous um, protocols that they have to go through to get, get the designation at the end if they do. And we're hoping that in January we'll be able to let people know exactly what's happened with the six that we have in process right now. So we're, we're very excited about that. We know that sounds like a long way off, but really January is just right around the corner. Um, please keep us posted. I will definitely want to try you that bet. chocolate. Um, you bet. This, I, I, I do believe that this is something that everybody that loves chocolate needs to um, care about and understand what's going on in the industry. And I would love to hear from each one of you uh, what we can do to help um, and help save our chocolate. So Pam, what would be your, uh, your idea of what we could do? Well, I think from a aficionado, from a chocolate lover, which I happen to be, perspective, it really comes down in, in my mind to supporting the people who are making great chocolate. Um, we can always, you know, have our 
Hershey's Kisses when we're playing with the kids, but we really need to get out and start tasting some of these really, really interesting chocolates that are coming out from the different uh, chocolate makers and chocolatiers that um, have sprung up in many of our regions, many of our regions over this time. I think it, the best thing we can do is get educated, start educating our little taste buds, which is really a great thing, not a, not a problem at all, and supporting and buying those people, the chocolates from those people who are, who are doing a really great um, uh, taste and flavor. Lindell, how about you? I have to agree with, with Pam. The, the best way for people to get involved is to be trying those great flavored chocolates because the if you're eating great flavored chocolate, that means somebody's making it. If they're making it, they're buying it from someone. If we can get more people to eat chocolate and, and we're talking the fine flavored chocolate, then they're going to be making more and they're going to be seeking out those new types. And we know that there's types out there. so. It's just a matter of, of locating them and getting them in the hands of, the, of fine chocolate makers who can then present it to the public who can then try it. So I, I totally agree with Pam. And Dan, since you're back, let me um, try to get you involved. Um, we're asking what we can do um, as chocolate lovers um, to help save our chocolate. From the other end, where the beans come from, I think the thing that we found is amazing is the impact it has on the people on the ground. When they can get value for their crop and, and, and they have the pride of producing really fine chocolate, we discovered it accidentally and found out through Lindell that what we had found is extremely rare. Uh, the consumer loves it, but the producer makes more money, they can educate their children, they have a great sense of pride. They want to produce the best, but they can't unless they get value for it. And so it comes all the way from the beginning to the end of the supply <laughs> chain. If you want value, it takes work, it takes effort, and you got to like the taste. So, Jim, how about you? Well, I, you know, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, um, yeah, I think uh, Pam and Lindell said it right. I, to quote Marion Nessel, um, I would say, you know, whose line was, vote with your fork. I mean, so vote with your palate. You know, select high, get, we did this with wine. We, we did this with heirloom tomatoes. You know, really just start to understand what um, fine chocolate is, where, you know, there is, there's good, there's great. Understand where it comes from. Education is important. And really try as many things as you can. And I'll use the line that I used back when I was talking to CBS, uh, uh, which is, and then find your yummy, you know, and just keep, you know, and 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 keep eating and trying it and exploring what's going on and and understand more and then share it with your friends. And if you want to turn your enemies into friends, there's no better way than chocolate. I can't think of another way. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I think um, people are always interested to learn more about chocolate, and um, when we tell them um, all all about this, they they're willing to get on board. Um, so I want to close with a thank you to all of you to Dan Pearson from Marion Chocolate. Unfortunately, we couldn't um, have him full on um, due to some technical issues, and Pam Williams from Ecole Scola. Go after Jim Eber, who is the HCP, Jim Eber, who is the HCP director of communication and administration, and Lindo Meinhart from the USDA Agricultural Research Service for taking time out of your busy and on the conversation. We wish you much success with the heirloom cacao preservation initiative and your goal to save our chocolate. Thanks for watching and get out there and enjoy some fine chocolate while you can. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.